All right, I have a Moroccan trilobite. I got it at Dinosaur World. He's a cutie guy. And I used a macro on him, a macro lens on him recently. And all along the bottom here, there are microscopic baby trilobites. Wow. 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 That's pretty cool. That's yeah. Pretty cool. I love using macro on things. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Just leave that there. What up, Rob? Thank you. Appreciate that. As I was telling Mike, I just got back Tuesday, um, spent six days climbing around out in the Badlands. Oh, oh man. Wow. I could not leave these two little cutie pies. Oh, or, gosh. Oh. Very nice. One of the guys I went with is driving back. Well, he's back now in Atlanta. But I brought those in the suitcase. I said I, I got to play with them when I get home. So. <laughs> that's as that's as about as small as they come. That one on the right. They don't stay together much smaller now. Yeah, this this one was actually coming apart. Um, it was sticking out of the bank underneath a, a sagebrush bush, and it was starting to disarticulate. So I luckily had a lot of glue with me and glued them back together before it could blow up. And you made it only one piece, and then I was able to stabilize them. That's nice. Very cool. So, thank you. You may, you may else have stuff. Yes, sir. There's stuff there. Yes. <laughs> Dave brought some stuff up. So, Dave Latassi is our speaker tonight. Are you going to stand or sit down? I'll stand. Okay. This will be quick. Uh, I would call 2020 21 uh, the year of Spinosaurus. And so I, I've been working a lot on some of the uh, spinosaur fossils. And uh, th actually a lot of this was collected by a guy by the name of Harry Miller. I don't know if any of you guys, you probably know Harry. Uh, Phyllis Miller, she was a wonderful fossil collector. Uh, Harry and Phyllis went to Morocco, that was in the 1990s. And uh, Chris Deloria and I were putting some uh, Moroccan Chem Chem formation material together for the Brevard County Zoo. And uh, we went through a lot of this material from Harry Miller. Uh, the jaw you see here actually is a composite from the original specimen that was destroyed in World War II. Uh, the teeth are real, but the jaw, of course, was destroyed in World War II. But it, it is a full-scale size jaw of a Spinosaurus that was found in Egypt. Uh, the claws here were actually from Morocco, and they do relate these teeth and the claws with one dinosaur. Some people consider Spinosaurus a chimera, which is a combination of a number of different dinosaurs. Uh, but enough material starting to be found recently, especially in the last year, uh, where we actually found uh, uh, the tail bones from Spinosaurus that's related to the specimen that was on national television called Bigger Than T-Rex. And some of you probably have seen that, that program on TV. But the interesting thing about the caudal vertebrae, the backbone, is that the dorsal spine is three times the length of the centra. And so uh, Najer, uh, he's a fellow that found a part of the skeleton that's in Morocco called uh, 11888 that's in the Moroccan Museum, uh, that the tail's are related to the back end that they found. And so the actual tail bones had a dorsal spine, very much like the the front of the animal, other than, although it's a much shorter spine. But we, we reconstructed this one so you could see how large the spine was on this animal. So this is all pointing towards a, a, an aquatic environment for the animal. Interestingly too, we, uh, we did find um, Carcharodontosaurus teeth with this animal. So yeah. there were some very large land predators, but everything's pointing towards Spinosaurus being uh, somewhat of an aquatic animal. We don't think it was fully aquatic. It was most likely uh, a shore dweller where it was eating fish on occasion. And isotopes, oxygen isotopes on the teeth is actually showing that uh, they were actually eating a little bit of, of fish and land animals. And then the river site that was just discovered actually has uh, literally uh, a thousand teeth from dinosaurs and prehistoric animals in the Kem Kem deposit in northern Morocco. And uh, actually the teeth 
40% of the teeth found out of 1,000 were Spinosaurus. And so we believe it was in a estuary and somewhat aquatic environment. And one little bone here that I thought for sure in the very beginning was going to be possibly a juvenile or a baby Spinosaur because it's, you know, it's really tiny and small, turned out to be a new pterosaur. So it's actually a pterodactyl. So when you get a chance after the lecture, come on up here, take a look at it, especially the, the rear toe here, it's very turtle-like. So they consider that an aquatic animal. And this, the claws are referred to from another dinosaur from Kenya, uh, from uh, Najir that was recently discovered in the last 10 years. And the claws are very similar to that Spinosaur that's found in Niger. And they believe that these claws are related to the Spinosaur from North Africa. So there's gonna be a lot of research. There's a, right now there's I think a dozen or two dozen uh, programs on the YouTube channels on Spinosaurus. So if you get a chance, check it out. It's pretty interesting stuff. Well, you can stay up here and I'll introduce you as you put this on. Okay. And I'll clip you to your line. Yeah, this isn't part of the program. <laughs> this is just a little, little perk. It's a small clip. That's okay. Are you cold and free? I'm, 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 I was actually holding my breath, so I'm standing here a second. <laughs> well, I am back I think I'm that worried. So David Tassi's been around Florida for a long time. His, his accent though tells me he's from Michigan at least, Western Michigan probably. Uh, that my Good guess. Dad's yeah. family's all from, from that area. Uh, he's worked for Great Exploration Museum in St. Petersburg. He's worked for the Museum of Science and Industry in Posey. And he might be able to tell you where, where he came from prior to that. I, I first met Dave when he worked for uh, Great Explorations in the Children's Museum over right. in St. Petersburg probably 25 years ago yeah, at least. So, so I, I, I don't know how long you've been here. Uh, one of the articles I read about him online said he was collecting and tracking fossils and archaeological sites as early as eight years old. We have two documented sites, two documented archaeological sites in Michigan before you were 10 years old. 12. 12. 12. <laughs> and uh, so he's been into it for as long as, or longer than some of us. Uh, he's retired, I think, officially now from those, but he works for, I had to read this from the, uh, he's a coordinator for the Historic Fernando County Preservation Society in the Seminole Tribe of Florida and the Gulf Archaeological Research Institute of Gainesville. And as you put in the newsletter we have up there on the screen, you're talking about the terror pigs and walking whales. I cannot believe he is able to speak about anything but cats or cats <laughs> or maybe cats. So he's stepping out of his comfort zone, right. I guess, going to talk about the terror pigs and walking whales. If you saw my mistake on Facebook, I had W-A-L-E-S. I don't think he's going to be talking about the region of the world. I didn't direct it back to whales. So. Everybody welcome Dave Latassi. He knows very much. Thank you. I'll be probably standing a little bit and I might be sitting down to, um, I'm cursed with uh, a hip prosthesis that was put in in 2006 and is on its way out. So, <laughs> so I might sit a little bit during the program. But as you can see here by the title, uh, it's kind of strange to imagine, you know, that we have pigs that were as large as some of the elephants that were here in Florida. And uh, we had whales that actually walked on the land. But the interesting thing about these two groups of animals is it really points to what we see with diversity related to convergent and divergent physiology of animals, how animals were structured by their skeletal remains. Unfortunately, we don't have too many animal remains that are completely preserved other than stuff that's found in permafrost. But when you get back into the Cretaceous period, and like here during the Miocene period and earlier here in Florida, uh, we don't, don't have much ice here or much of an ice age, so we don't see that kind of preservation. But we do find a lot of bones. And the, the thing that's interesting is that these two groups of animals are actually very, very closely related to one another. And uh, because of the relationship of recent research that's being carried on over the last 25 years, uh, we are actually finding how that relationship came about. Next slide. Or do I do that? <laughs> okay, I can do that. All right. So you can see in this picture here, that this whole story started over 150 years ago about uh, the, the, the physiology of whales 
And some of the uh, large animals that were found at least 100 years ago, which was in Asia during the Asiatic expedition in the 1920s, was this very unusual skull called Androsarcus. And it led a couple of scientists to think about, well, really, what was the origin of this animal? It was very strange. The skull is over three feet long, very large jaw, skull. No, uh, no lower jaw, no postcrania, just one skull. It was found in Asia. Next slide. Uh, this pig, we believe, was at least larger than a man, at least this size. And the fellow that found it, next slide, Walter Granger, actually uh, thought when he first found it that it was an animal uh, that was called an artiodactyl or a giant pig. And his boss that was over him on this expedition was Roy Chapman Andrews. And it's kind of funny how these guys kind of started working together. Uh, Andrews was actually the janitor for the American Museum of Natural History. And uh, he was uh, actually worked for the CIA in World War I in China. And he felt, and his bosses, that the origin of man and some of the early animals, like the early mammals, uh, originated in China rather than Africa. There were kind of two views. People either originated in Africa or they originated in China, Asia. And so the American Museum went for Asia. And they allowed Chapman to put the, the exec, uh, these expeditions together. And his head paleontologist was Walter Granger. In fact, Walter would say, don't give uh, Andrews a specimen of a fossil. He'll break it or destroy it. <laughs> he wasn't really a paleontologist like Granger was. Granger was trained. But he actually thought this skull was a giant pig. And his boss, Henry Fairfield Osborne from the American Museum says, what the heck's the matter with you? You don't know the difference between a giant carnivore creodont and a giant pig? And so there was a discussion in it and they were in disagreement at the American Museum on what this animal was. Next slide. So Osborne kept saying, well, it has to be a giant pig. Uh, and and it, it, it can't be a giant pig, it has to be a creodont, one of these large carnivore animals. And Andrews, of course, was just there for the, putting the expedition together. Next slide. Okay. So this expedition was in central China. And you can see that this was very much dinosaur expedition area, but they were also finding mammal fossils in the Gobi. So there was a, uh, actually a combination of both uh, Eocene, Oligocene fossils in China, and a lot of Cretaceous dinosaurs, the first dinosaur age in the Gobi Desert. Now that area that you see there, that's like Don Zhang, very difficult to pronounce, okay? <laughs> kind of sort toward the middle in that area. Um, I don't know if any of you guys knew Eric Prokofke. The Eric was where he found his Tyrannosaur skeleton. He became kind of infamous. Next slide. Okay, so here's what Osborne thought this animal was, this gigantic or primitive, really basic carnivore called messianics type animal or a creodont. And the interesting thing about these animals is that they have hoofs on their feet even though they're considered a primitive carnivore. And they're principally found in Asia. And we do have some of them in Western North America too, in the Eocene period. Next slide. Now, of course, scientists like to actually figure out what things are. And we try to come up with cladograms and we start putting one skeleton with another skeleton. So here was like one of the early attempts on what our Androsarcus was. Androsarcus, since Osborne thought that it was a creodont, they took this little leptictus body of a very small, early creodont-like carnivore animal, and they matched it to the skull, and they came up with this idea that this is what this animal was like, Androsarcus. Next slide. Here's what they thought it looked like in the flesh, very large carnivore, probably one of the largest carnivores of the mammalian group, very large, gigantic animal. Next slide. And here's the skull. But the interesting thing is that when you look at the structure of the skull of Androsarcus, it's very similar to cetacean skulls. Very, very similar. And the dentition is very primitive like giant pig, has large sharp teeth like many of the toothed whales. 
And so there's a lot of similarities between the back of the skull with this animal and some of the early cetaceans, especially the arcaceet or early whales here that we find in Florida in our Ocala formation. Next slide. Okay. So, here is really the photograph of the skull, what it looks like. As you can see, a number of the teeth are actually uh, missing in the front. Uh, it's mostly the cranium itself is complete, but uh, a lot of the teeth are missing. So there, it's a good reason why there was a lot of controversy on this animal. Next slide. Okay, so let's look at the giant pig. And Susie, if you would take out of that box the giant pig jaw, we can hand that over to some of the people that can take, yeah, take a look at it. So when you look at the dentition of these giant pigs, there's a great deal of similarity between the giant pigs and some of the early whales that are called archaeocete uh, whales or yoke-toothed whales. And the picture on the left, the skull on the left, is the skull of an archaeocete whale. We do find teeth of these here in Florida in our sediments. Has anybody ever found part of one of these whales here for fossil collecting? Part of a tooth. A tooth? <laughs> part of a tooth. Part of a tooth. And that's usually as good as it gets. Yeah. And then as you get up into the Carolinas, they, they find a little bit more. Uh, that, that's the jaw right there, the big jaw. You can pull that up. You can, the jaw. This the one. The jaw. Why <laughs> yeah. did you say this one the was jaw. in my hand? I <laughs> thought this was the jaw. The jaw. That, that's the uh, that's a, uh, it's a it's a giant pig called Archaeotherium. And how many of you have found Archaeotherium fossils out in the Badlands? Because I know a lot. Yeah, yeah, a few of you have found. Them. They're not really extremely common. They're a little scarcer. Other than some people I've found are very lucky in finding the Nicta saber tooth cat skull. <laughs> But they're, they're a little little more common than saber cats, but not a lot. And a lot of people would love to find a, a giant pig skull. That's the skull on the right of Archaeotherium. And the interesting thing about these uh, giant pigs are called terror pigs. And you know, television, the media has, everything's like gigantic, everything's horrible, everything's amazing creature, you know, from the Hollywood entertainment field. The interesting thing I find about the pigs in general, the giant pigs, is that they have a perfect tooth row. They actually have 11 teeth on each side, a perfect set, 44 teeth with the uppers and lowers combined. And you find the same thing with primitive whales. They also have a rather complete tooth row. Now the morphology or the shape of the teeth are a little bit different. Uh, the back teeth are very moliform. They like, they're actually very similar to your back teeth in your mouth, so you, you have some relationship to pigs. Should I, should I have said that? <laughs> well, we're, we're at least omnivores. We have a diet that uses a tooth like that with a molar that has four cusps on it that crushes up sometimes meat, sometimes vegetables, something in between, whatever. A bug, a snake. So anyway, these giant pigs, next slide may very well closely be related to whale. And there was a long um, search in the fossil record to see exactly where, how whales originated. Uh, Osborne's group and other paleontologists at that time felt that these early primitive Eocene Archaeocene whales, like Basiliosaurus, were whales that were actually related to the creodonts. He kept going back to this creodont family of early primitive carnivores. Next slide. And when the first basiliosaur, one of these uh, toothed whales that were found in Alabama in 1834, they sent these fossils to Richard Owens. He was like the head guru in England in the 1830s. And uh, he's the one that uh, named dinosaur dinosaurs. A lot of people liked them and some people didn't like them so much. Some people said he would steal from the amateurs. Uh, they're, We've never heard that happen before. <laughs> <laughs> and so Richard uh, actually looked at these fossils from these large giant uh, sharp, like whales that were found here in, in Southeast United States, the Arcaceed whales, and he determined them to be whales and not primitive reptiles because, next slide, when, when uh, they were first found by Richard Harlan in Alabama, 
uh, they named it a basilosaurus, which just meant king lizard. And of course, these skeletons were really rather partial. Uh, even here in, uh, in Alabama, you're lucky if you find a series of vertebrae like that in the rib cages. Uh, skulls are usually very fragmentary, which is kind of normal in paleontology. And so the back portion, the rear of the animal was rarely ever found, but it actually did have primitive legs and a pelvis. So they are related to animals that were walkers on the land. But it was just enough evidence of these animals that other paleontologists were really curious as to really what is the origin of the cetaceans or the whales. Next slide. Okay, so here's part of the back, the back rear legs. And then this was what really got the scientists starting to think about it, that if some of these whales, these early primitive whales had vestigial rear legs, they may be related to something uh, that would have to be a land walker like the creodonts. And that was the thing to figure out if it was an early primitive uh, carnivore. Next slide. <coughs> so here we see some of the ancestors that we pretty well now know. There's one on the upper right is Amplicetus. Uh, they believe it came from a land ancestor. And the, uh, to the bottom right are Balanoptera, the more modern um, keratin fringed whales that are filter feeders. And then like Rhodocetus up there, which is a toothed whale, like our orca. Next slide. <coughs> now, the, another animal that's quite common here in the southeastern United States is fossils in the Carolinas are the backbones of Doridon. Susie, you want to show that? Why don't you pass that Doridon around? Is this, this thing here? Yeah, this the, thing. the cervical vertebrae of a Doridon. <laughs> this is actually Arcosine whale vertebra. Why, why not get it back? <laughs> you have to return these. These are part of a pro. <laughs> we're, we're, we're actually um, like the spinosaurus that I just brought in to show some of the diversity with convergence and divergence. Um, spinosaurus are dinosaurs that want to be crocodiles. Their skulls are very much like crocodiles. And so some animals mimic other animals. And so they call these uh, characteristics convergent or divergent where two, an, two groups of animals can be co totally directly related to one, one another uh, physiologically and uh, DNA-wise, but look totally different and are doing two different things. And then other groups will be totally different than one another, but they're actually genetically this, pretty close to one another or the same family. So we have these things called divergence and convergence. And it really confuses paleontology because when something mimics something else, it's darn hard to figure out what it is. And that's, that's one of the problems with spinosaurus. We know it's a dinosaur, but it's doing some really crazy things that wanted to be a crocodile. And when you start looking at some of the animals like Basiosaurus and Dorodon, they were replacing an earlier group of animals, next slide, that lived in the Cretaceous period. And they all came from after the great KT boundary, the destruction of about 90% of the life on Earth because of the meteor strike, uh, they, everything kind of got mixed and started over. And now you have a series of small mammals that really created and started developing to, into our modern animals that we have today. Next slide. Okay. Now here's an animal called Indahyas. And Hyas is actually pig from India. And this is a, or an Eocene pig. And it's one of the earliest forms of skulls that we believe is like a proto um, giant pig. Very much like the Antelodonts, Archaeotherium. You guys find the Archaeotherium fossils out west in the Badlands. And so you can see by the molars in the back, they have kind of that four cusp molar like we do and like modern pigs do and like Archaeotherium, the giant pigs have. Next slide. So it's very possible that some of these early forms of animals uh, in Asia were starting to develop into these giant super omnivores. They, they, ate, they could eat animal flesh, you know, they believed that they were predators, but they could also take in different kinds of plants and roots and, uh, and uh, other kinds of food besides just meat. 
they were so heavily built, these primitive pigs, that they believed that they could actually run up against an animal like a rhinoceros and actually just hit it in the side just with its force of its head and knock it over and then with its teeth just break its neck or crush its skull. And there's actually sites out where so they've actually found uh, skulls of different kinds of plant-eating animals where their skulls at the back were crushed. In fact, I have one in my collection where it was the animal was like a little deer and it was actually bitten in the back of the skull by a predator, like either a giant pig or, a, or one of these uh, kind of bear dog looking things that lived at that time. Next slide. Okay. Now, we actually had these animals <laughs> living here in Florida. And I can tell you right now, I don't know if anybody in this group has found a giant pig tooth or bone from the giant pig in Florida. Anyone? Did you spot? No. No. no it's pretty rare. Uh, but I just did mention Harry and Phyllis Miller. And actually, there's a giant pig that lived here in Florida and out in the Badlands called Dinohias. It was the monster pig. This thing was almost the size of a small elephant. The, the, the back of the back would be as high up to that exit sign up there. So it was a very large animal. The skulls were over four and a half feet long. So it was, it was a super form. The lower jaw would be twice as big as this jaw here from Archaeotherium. The Archaeotherium was the little guy and Dinohias was the big guy. And this was back, I believe it was 83. Uh, Phil, uh, Phyllis and Harry were, were scuba diving in the Suwannee River, and they actually brought up the lower jaw of one of these Dinahias giant pigs here in Florida. And they didn't really have an idea what it was. At first, when uh, Harry looked at it, he thought the back teeth reminded him of a small mastodon. And so he took it up to Dave Webb, at the University of Florida. And Dave said, Dave said, oh my gosh, you have the lower jaw of a giant pig. First time ever found in Florida. And so that actually existed here. That animal's here in Florida. Next slide. But if you want to see them in the skeletal form, because University of Florida doesn't have one, and there's a story behind that, but I'm not going to relate that story. You can ask me if you come up after the program and I'll relate that story, why there isn't one in the University of Florida. But uh, this is, anybody been out here to Agate Springs, Nebraska? Yeah, yeah the Searles and Bob over there, them guys are always over out there. <laughs> But uh, you guys live out there half the year, don't you? Pretty much. I wish. But uh, these are the two, two of the three hills. I think the other one you can kind of see over there. Uh, there are a series of uh, rock formations where you find the giant pig skeleton. And it was just amazing. Uh, the guy that owned the land was uh, bought, actually got the land through land grants in the 1870s. I don't know if you saw the crook exhibit, his beautiful Indian artifacts in that exhibit there. Oh my God. Amazing. If you, if you ever go out west to Nebraska, you got to see this place. They have a wonderful interpretive center. And you can walk up on the hills and you can see where they were excavating in the early 1900s. But when <coughs> Crook found the, Cook found the um, fossils up there in the 1870s, all the Indians in the area said, yeah, those are war ponies. Those were horses that were killed in a battle. You know, everything <laughs> was like a giant war horse to them, thunder beast they called them. Next slide. So these animals were pretty ferocious. This, this site here in Nebraska was found uh, a few years ago and uh, they actually found these uh, little camels were actually crushed and killed by the giant pigs. So they were, they were super predators. Next slide. I like to call them walking whales. They were like ferocious predator whales walking on the land. Very, very different animals. They're, we can't, we like to call them giant pigs, but that's a kind of a stretch. They're really not exactly a pig, but they are very similar to, there's that convergence and divergence again, see? Okay, and there's the lower jaw we just showed you there. Now, this one was found at the same site that Cope found the first ones in the 1870s uh, in North 
northeastern Colorado. And it, you can tell it has the big boss on the front of the jaw. We don't know why it had these bosses, it's hard to say. They're very strange. Next slide. And Edward Drinker Cope, here's a guy that was first that discovered these. And you guys probably have heard of Cope. Uh, he's famous for his mineral called the coprolite. <laughs> right. Marsh named it after him. It was a very honorable thing. <laughs> but Edward, he was uh, probably one of the most amazing paleontologists. It's too bad it had to be a war out west for fossil collecting, but uh, he brought the uh, giant pigs to national attention and just about pretty much everything else. Uh, during that time period, Di all kinds of dinosaurs. Next slide. Okay. All right. So, muscle and mass mass murderers. Because of this uh, idea that these were such terrible animals, the media has just loved to play this uh, prehistoric animal shows. So it's become very popular. Uh, it, they were probably just as much as herbivores as they were carcasses. They were probably eating some, you know, uh, dead carcasses, scavenging and things like that. Uh, they're, they're probably opportunistic, like some of the dinosaurs, you know. Next slide. Okay. So there's there's kind of a picture of Deodon, Shoshonensis. So it got really got, in fact, uh, that drawing there is a little off. They, they would get a little bit bigger even than that, some of them. The Arcatherium, which is about that size, the one that you guys can out, go out west and collect here. You might find the Deodon out there. It's kind of hard to find. There's a couple of places in South Dakota you can find some of their fossils called the Monroe Creek Formation in the very extreme uh, southwestern South, <coughs> South Dakota. Next slide. <coughs> so here we are back to the Antelodon skull in Andrasarcus. Were they an active hunter? Well, there's a good likelihood now with the current research that's being developed and cat scanning these skulls at Androsarcus that, it's, that now Gray, uh, Walter Granger was actually proven right with the new research that the scientists are leaning towards this giant Androsarcus was actually a giant pig. It was a very primitive Eocene giant pig. And so Granger was the paleontologist that really kind of cracked this code 100 years ago. Next slide. And as you can see with the skulls here, that the Arcasini whales and the Androsarcus, they're extremely similar. There's a lot of features that are very close to one another. So there are overlapping characteristics in the skulls. Next slide. Now, scavenging behavior or terrestrial. Why would a group of animals start becoming marine? And you see this, <laughs> this real strange whatever animal on the left here from Elmay, which is uh, probably a first rendition of what was actually walking on the land and going into the water as a whale family. But in actuality, there's a good likelihood that some form of primitive and Antelodon, giant pig, was probably one of the animals related to the early Arcticeid cetaceans. Next slide. And in the 1980s, the University of Michigan started really getting interested in the cetaceans. My mentor was actually from uh, the University of Michigan, Dr. Claude W. Hibbard. And uh, Hibby and I knew each other for about 25 years. Remember, I was about that tall when I started collecting fossils. And I'd go into his lab and he treated me just like I was any professor in a university when I came in there. He's just a brilliant guy. Uh, a lot of you are collecting fossils here in Florida called the Pliocene fossils. You've heard of that? <laughs> well, actually, Hibbert discovered the Pliocene. And before the Pliocene, everybody thought fossils were either in the Ice Age, the Pleistocene, or the Miocene nothing in between. And Claude came up with a genius idea. He went to these fossil sites where everybody wanted big bones and big skeletons. And he took screen washings and he took the gravel and he screen washed it 
in the same sediments where they were finding the large bone, and he was finding all kinds of rodent teeth, and little tiny bat teeth, and carnivore teeth, microfossils. Have any of you ever collected microfossils with their sites? Ah, there I see a couple of hands up. We're, we're actually, Chris Delore and I and a friend of mine are developing some programs with microfossils related to the fossils here in Florida and out in the dinosaur area. We're getting Cretaceous sediments from the KT boundary and we're washing them and we're screening it with students because this is this dinosaur exhibit you here you saw tonight was part of a school program. We're actually doing a mentor program with the Yankee Town Elementary in Levy County, Florida. And we actually have students actually do the field work collecting marine fossils and microfossils. Next slide. Okay. So these animals that were first getting into these early Oligocene and Miocene oceans here were very weird of adaptation. Here's one that has a skull that's almost like U-shaped, very strange animals. Marcosetus. So in in the Ocala formation and later in the in the Miocene and Pliocene deposits, we find some very strange adaptations of cetaceans that are like the ones that just jumped off the early primitive Arcosine reptile-like whales. Next slide. <coughs> and the guy that really put this all together was the fellow that when I came in, Dr. Hibbert died of a massive heart attack in his office one morning. And I came up to his office to see him and they, told, they gave me the bad news that he had passed. And uh, Dr. Gingrich said, Dave, he'd like me to have you give you these scientific papers. And they gave me a bunch of his scientific papers uh, about a week after he had passed. And so as I was <coughs> going up there during that time period, uh, Philip was working on um, cetacean fossils from Pakistan. He put a team together. Uh, Claude was gone now, and the, the Pliocene fossil era ended at the University of Michigan. And they wanted to study the Eocene fossils in Pakistan and the origin of primitive whales. And so Philip put an expedition together. Pakistan back then in the early 80s, in the late 70s, very dangerous place to collect. They had to have a escort of machine guns and armed personnel with you when you collected. Next slide. But he found some of these animals that are related to Arcosine whales, like this duodong, uh, duodong bone that we just passed around. Everybody get a chance to see that? We, we got another one here. Susie, where is it? That one? <laughs> <laughs> pass, the, pass the little one around. Now here's another cervical vertebrae from a baleen whale. Wow. Just pass that around. They started getting a little bit larger, but the Basiliosaurus, the Arcosine whales, would get up to 70 feet long. So Spinosaurus, they, we believe, would get up to 60 feet. So that tooth whale is a little even larger than... It's too heavy. <laughs> it's too heavy. So be careful with it. Yeah. Do not bludgeon each other with it as you pass it around. <laughs> Next slide. So here's what was going on at that time. And you can see the Tethys Ocean up there, right? Up there between Africa and what looks almost like Asia. And when you look at the Cretaceous period up here, through that area in there, that's where Spinosaurus comes from. So it was actually a, a, a shore wader along this shallow sea. There you go. <laughs> and, uh, and so this area here is where we find Spinosaurus fossils, which were aquatic ad adaptation, and it was actually more brackish water, very much like the Everglades. And then by the Eocene period, when the whales came in, because the whales, there were mosasaurs that were living <coughs> in this ocean, and then the great die-off at the end of the Cretaceous disappeared, these, these marine reptiles, and then the primitive whales came into this Tethys Ocean, and in the same areas, Africa and Egypt area, like around in here, you find the fossils from these early whales, and especially in this area, right, right around in here, where is present-day Pakistan. Next slide. 
Oh, oh, there you go. Okay, so as Bob had said earlier, he found a tooth, and that's a fragment of a tooth that we found here in Florida. And the, the, the specimen on the right in my hand is actually a, uh, a uh, tooth of it. It's a cast. Next slide. No, there will be no information. <laughs> I, I, I first gave this program about a year ago on Zoom, so it's going to be on Zoom twice, I guess, today. And uh, that program uh, was for Eckert College. And uh, of course, their group are a little antsy. They don't like to go more than 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and then they want to take a potty break. <laughs> so I had to throw an intermission in. So here's what. Gingrich's group found, they found this animal called Pachycetus. Next slide. It's very fragmentary. The skull was enough there that they could restore it. So it was very similar to a giant pig. It was very close to it. Next slide. And it had something very interesting. Since this animal walked on the land, and I did say this was a walking on walking whales program, <laughs> and this one did walk, uh, the rear legs actually had this kind of double pulley shaped astragalus or ankle bone, which is absolutely similar to camels and bison and our other artiodactyls. So now the consensus is that these animals, this is the early primitive cetaceans are related to our camels and our pigs. So there's a good relationship to recognize now that, the arch that these ar archaeotherium like animals like the entelodon could very well have been the originator of the cetacean. Next slide. And there's some examples of animals like that. One up there to the middle, upper is a deer. And you can see the different dimensions. And how many have found these in the rivers here? Because you can find that this is a fairly common fossil in Florida. And it's just characteristic of an artiodactyl. Everybody know the difference between Artiodactyls and they're even toed, odd toed. Presodactyls are the odd toes, and the artiodactyls are the even toed. So they, they walk on two toes. That's, that's what defines them. And you can see right here the bovid. Anybody got cattle on their ranch? <laughs> Next slide. Okay, so I, I like this one. Don't you just love it? It's great. So, so th th this is kind of the gist of where mm -hmm. the paleontologists figure this was the morphing of this animal from some kind of pig-like animal that was probably scavenging along the shorelines during that Tethys Ocean. And we'd probably come across dead fish every now and then. And little by little, it just kept going further and further into the water. And, became aquatic, fully aquatic, and then marine. Next slide. And here's the Amblycetus skull. You can see even the, how close and similar they are to one another with the one that's found here in southeastern United States. Virtually the, very close to the same animals in, in the shape of the teeth, dentition, and the shapes of the skull. Next slide. And the back of the skull is just remarkable how similar they are. And this is a latest specimen found of Amblycetus by Hewison. It's his work. He's doing a lot of work. There's a lot of whale work going on right now. And Florida here, if anybody should be doing whale work, it's this group because we have an Oligocene deposit and late Eocene deposit at Vulcan Mine that could produce whale fossils. And Oligocene whales here in North America are extremely rare. And so when you guys get out and collect fossils, Try to find vertebrates. I mean, they're really out there. We, uh, one of my classes is back in the 90s found an anonymous from a dugong. So, you know, these fossils are out there, Protosirenia. There's two animals that are really rare out there at Vulcan Mine, uh, the Protosirenian, which are the very early primitive dugongs. And uh, they're, they're, they had rear legs, those dugongs. And then the whales, and they, were, they would have been transitional at the Oligocene, where they would have rear, rear legs. So look for bone when you're out there. You just never know. Next slide. Okay. So here you have the Chicxulub event. Everybody know what that is, of course. 
the big meteor that struck Yucatan Peninsula, wiped out these guys to the left in the marine sediments. Those are the marine reptiles like the uh, big predators like plesiosaurs and mosasaurs. And then the mammals took over in the ocean and finally mammals adapted to the ocean and took over this ecosystem that uh, the, the marine reptiles were doing. Next slide. So, terrestrial origin of Pachycetus. Both legs in the back with the astra astragalus. So it's a definite transition from a shoreline environment, just like Spinosaurus, it's a good likelihood. If Spinosaurus didn't hit the KT boundary, they probably would have lost their legs and didn't look like a big whale, kind of a crocodile looking whale, you never know. It's fun to imagine these things. <laughs> Who knows? We don't, it's interesting, we don't have late Cretaceous Spinosaurus. So if you want to get out in Africa and look at late Cretaceous, they're looking for the late Cretaceous Spinosaurus. These are kind of middle Cretaceous. And they found two new Spinosaurus in Africa. That's something for nothing. Next slide. Okay. So there's the ankle system again. And, that, and you can see on the right the marine adaption. So that determines where, where the origin of this group came from. Next slide. And what do we have today that's even remotely close to it? Genetically, and what we believe today is that these hippopotamus are the closest thing we have to the giant pigs in the early cetaceans. They're, they're more closely related to one another genetically, DNA, and physiology. And it doesn't take much of a stretch of imagination to see how the hippo is so extremely similar to the giant pigs. So this, this is really the kind of stuff scientists are looking for with this convergence and divergence. Next slide. Because we're gonna run through some of this stuff quickly. Giant tusk, huge animal. River, aquatic. Four legs, but it's aquatic. What's it eat? Anybody know what hippo eats? Whatever it wants. Whatever it wants. It's actually a grazer. It comes up at night, eats grass. Next slide. Go figure, you know, grass eater. Giant deodon. Could it be a giant hippo? I, there's no evidence that these were aquatic at all. They were terrestrial, and they were probably chasing your rhino footprint, right? You find any? Oh, no, no. <laughs> no, no Archaeotherium footprint. Next slide. Okay, and here's a tooth from Diodon from Florida. There's only a few in private collections of Diodon, unfortunately. Uh, some of the specimens are in private collections. I think one was on display at one of our club meetings a few years ago. One of Andre's specimens? Yep. Yep. That was a Swanee River. That was a pretty cool specimen, wasn't it? The Teledon he had? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, the whole thing, yeah. Yeah, next slide. We have them here, but they're rare. Okay, paleoform, next slide. Okay, so there you can see the similarities, the Zugalon, Archaeocetes, the Zugalodont skulls, they're very primitive with the sharp yoke tooth shaped tooth. Next slide. And then during the Miocene period here in Florida, we have a vestige of these animals that still survived. You find them occasionally in uh, sediments here in Florida. Uh, they're called the yoke tooth whales or shark tooth whales. Uh, they're a squalodon. Uh, they're very unusual. They have very strange shape, curved uh, maxilla, front jaws. Next slide. And finally, you have the mainly the toothed whales that came out of this group of arpacete whales that like our dolphins, like pomatodelphus. Anybody have a pomatodelphus tooth or bone from, you find these in uh, Peace River quite a bit. It's a very primitive banjo-headed dolphin. Very long, about a six foot skull. Very interesting animal. Is that what we call the freshwater dolphin a lot of times? Yeah, very similar to it. Next slide. And we find a lot of the periodics and petrosals of these. 
find them almost anywhere in the Peace River on the beaches. Mm -hmm. yeah, very, very common. That was the outer part of the bottom of the skull that encased the inner ear bone. Next slide. And we did find, this was back in the 90s, at Bone Valley, we found a part of the jaw, what they call the megalodelphus, the giant dolphin, because there was a dolphin that lived here that got up to about 30 feet long in Bone Valley. And uh, the, the backbone on the left that I'm holding up is a cervical vertebrae. But on the right, you see there's two uh, ear bones, inner ear bones. And the one on the left is the uh, pomatodelphus dolphin, which is about 12 feet long. And its ear bone is about a half the size of the giant uh, dolphin, pomatodelphus uh, bobengi. And they used to think uh, that this was called uh, megalodelphus but we've kind of thrown that aim, name out now. It's actually uh, a, a, new, a different species that was actually found in Bone Valley and taken to University of Michigan and identified, and it isn't available here in Florida for study. You have to go up there to look at this thing. And that may be the only complete ear bone so far found in Florida. We found that in uh, Venice. Next slide. Okay, and that's part of the jaw. They're called megalodelphus. That's the giant dolphin, 30 foot long dolphin. It's like a orca, almost like an orca. The long snout. Next slide. So we'll go through this pretty quickly. That was kind of what pomatodelphus kind of looked like. Had the melon structure in the front, echo location. Next slide. Okay, there's one of the skulls. You can see how the nasal bone has migrated to the top of the skull. Right there. Next slide. And the bottom of the skull is very similar to the ar to the archaeotherium skull. That's ah, not working now. <laughs> Back to the skull. Next slide. Okay. And the tooth whales, the modern Odonta city. So that we're kind of divided into two modern groups of tooth whales. Next slide. And the baleen whales. And this is a primitive Miocene baleen whale. And we have a good record of baleen whales here in Florida and Bowen Valley in our sediments here. Next slide. So here's what we have in the way of cetaceans today. Those are the modern groups. Sperm whales, beak whales, River, do river dolphins, ocean dolphins, porpoises, and so on, beluga. So this is kind of how we have them laid out genetically and family-wise today, modern. Next slide. And this is again a simplification of the linear progression. And now that we have Amblycetus and Myocetus and all these other in-between ones, it's pretty easy to see the progression of these animals. Next slide. And if you want to get really confused and put together a cladogram, and scientists love putting, I don't like cladograms that much. I, I can look at any cladogram and change it 20 times. And I, I don't know, it's funny. But anyway, uh, when you look at the light blue color, the, are the kind of the whales, and then the pigs are like really close to it. So th there's really a close relationship. And now the scientific community is putting the pigs and the whales, you know, the giant entelodonts pretty close to one another. Next slide, as an artiodactyl. And the early carnivores, carnivoran. Next slide. What was it? Was it a carnivore from the carnivore? Well, now some scientists are saying that before the giant pigs and the entelodonts in the Paleocene period, there were little critters that were like the creodonts that started those guys. So we're almost back to Osborne again. Who, you know, it'll change next month. Okay. And if you want to get really confused, look at Arc Tree, the early hominids, getting up to Homo habilis. Uh, it used to be very, with a few fossils that looked very simple. Next slide. As more fossils became uh, known, it starts getting pretty bushy and branchy, which is normal with cladograms. Next slide. And if you want to get really confused, check out how the dogs are. These are all the breeds of dogs. 
that's how confusing it can get. And, here, and here's what's interesting because in 100,000 years from now, if a person finds fossil dogs in an archeological site and they didn't know about how many breeds we had at this time, they'd say, oh, this is a new species of dog. And you know, the pa uh, paleontologists like to name everything new. So, <laughs> so you know, they're gonna name a new species. Next slide. And this is where I sit down and you can ask me questions. <laughs> Any? Guys, know it all. <laughs> My question is related to those, um, like the artwork. Maybe Dr. Bob might know a little bit about this too. But when, when you look at a hippo skull, you would imagine they have these bony projections coming right. from their face, but as you all know, they've got a really big round head. When, when you look at these pig reconstructions, they, you know, I think I've heard the term called shrink wrap. They like shrink wrap the skulls and you see these big bony projections. I mean, is there a chance that's wrong that they had fleshier heads than that? Well, that, you know, that's a great question because when, when you start thinking about soft tissue on an animal, uh, it's, an, it's an unknown. Unless we find a trace fossil like you find in China where you have the outline of the animal and you can tell the plumage on it like some of the dinosaurs, uh, we're starting to see that in some deposits. But unfortunately, most of the fossil deposits like you find out west or in Asia you just find bone material. And so you're working with a, with a skull. And it's amazing, like when they uh, do criminology and they reconstruct a face, a human face from a skull, well, we're one species and we have parameters of what we look like. So we kind of know what we are. But when you have an animal that goes back 30 million years ago and we're not quite exactly sure what that flesh looked like on it, I think we, I think we get close but there's always new surprises because uh, some of the dinosaurs in, in China in the late Cretaceous, uh, they're finding uh, spiky plumes on the backs of the tail that they never knew before. And, and now they're even starting to see trace colors using different light imaging sources on the feathers. So we, we, if we find like a, um, a mold of the skin, you know, like some dinosaurs have mold and skin, then, then that might be a possibility. I know there was an interesting article recently on uh, the dinosaur uh, Carnotaurus, the bull dinosaur from South America. And they found out that a lot of the skull wasn't prepped properly when they were re first re you know, describing it. And now they know that the skull was much different. And then there's another one um, um, from New Mexico that they found better examples of profiles of the skeleton, and they know that they actually, the, sk the skulls were a, lot, a little bit different than they thought. So it's, it's possible it can happen, but right now with like the giant pigs, uh, it's really interesting. And, and when you say that, uh, some, there's something going on here with sexual dimorphism. It's very likely that the, uh, the smaller females didn't have the quite large bosses on the sides of their jaws. But when you find a big old bull hog, you know, then, then you see that older animal has these. And I think what was happening is as they were aging, like when they were very young, those bosses were kind of moderate sized in the males. And then as they got older, then those began to expand or get larger. Uh, it, it, it probably may have been a, a defensive mechanism. Uh, these things were probably fighting each other over carcasses. Uh, I don't know what the ratio of bite marks are on these are, because some of these animals, like dinosaurs, bit each other in the face when they were fighting on carcasses, feeding. And so there, that, there may have been some of that too. And so at some point in time, we, you never know, we may find out what was going on with those protuberances. But they're, they're, they're interesting. I have a, a juvenile skull of a, of a giant pig, and the, you can tell it was a pristine young little lady pig. You know, her, her bosses were just so dainty and tiny. <laughs> so we put her in a little dress or something. 
<laughs> Any other <laughs> question? They, you know, they, they, all these shows on TV about the Koopa and Cabra, the, the Puerto Rican, yeah. the, and that one slide with the, the teeth <laughs> looks just like the ones they show on TV with the red eyes and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. What's the chances of, that maybe some DNA slipped over to one pig and, and some type of <laughs> deformity occurred, and that's the Chupacabra? You want my cryptozoology lecture? <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, it's pretty fascinating. Uh, you know, I think it's possible, like some of the things, like some of the extinct animals, like uh, the Tasmanian yeah. tiger, you know, they're, they're still, there's still people seeing, they're sighting them. And, you know, I think some of those things could exist. And you, you never know. Um, Bears get into forest fires and they get deformed and they get burned and they can look pretty nasty sometimes. And I think, and then there's this uh, idea of legends, you know, where people love a legend. You know, I, I always get a kick out of it. There's a museum up in Georgia we go to, it's on uh, Bigfoot. If you ever get up there near Blairsville, it's a wonderful museum. And the center of Florida Bigfoot is Brooksville, Florida. So be careful when you go through books, really. You'll never be made skip a giant big one. But yeah, you never know. Uh, something like that. I, I think some of it is maybe deformed animals and, and local people that are more rural kind of get a little imaginary sometimes, you know, and, and keep their kids in line too. Yeah. You, know, like, you stay out of the woods, darn it. There's a chupacabra book at you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so modern stations, they have a hollow uh, gland in their bottom jaws that uh, allow for echolocation. Right. Some scientific research has been done on hippos as well as acoustics. Uh, has there been any papers that have tried to take a kind of parallel between both ends and the importance and development of with, with the hippopotamus? Yeah, with, with sound and, and resonance of the skull. I, I haven't seen anything in the literature on that. I'll, I'll look into that and see if there's a, any relationship. You, you know, the neat thing is, is there, there's everything you guys are collecting. So there's, there's so much possibility of so much research. On, uh, we're, we're like talking about doing a, uh, a, pro, a program on uh, oysters can talk. <laughs> dead, dead oysters can talk. And we had that great program, I don't know if you remember Mike, where the lady from USF was studying, the, uh, the guy was studying oysters. Peter Harry's. Yeah. Was that Harry's? I think so. I thought, okay. Uh, and you know, you can track like uh, levels of uh, the, the compounds and oxygen levels in these shells, and you can kind of determine what the climate was like in the past. And so that's kind of one of the things we're going to do is try to come up with a way to show how dead oysters talk, you know. So so almost anything you guys collect out there is uh, a, a research paper can come out of it. You might be talking uh, about the, the Russian guy from UF. Yeah, I think that's who it was, yeah. 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 I can't remember the guy's name, but that was a really good program. And like uh, the lady up in Gainesville that's doing Aturia, the little um, uh, Nautilus that's found here in Florida, you know, they're, they're the fossil that like, could, tons of papers could come out of that one little fossil. Just tons of stuff here in Florida. Yeah. Anything else? Any other questions? Thank you all.